This video explains human population dynamics. This is the last section under the population ecology videos. It's estimated that around 10,000 years ago, there were no more than 10 million people on Earth. The population remained fairly constant because death rates were very high. Some of the reasons for these high death rates were people died a lot from starvation and from disease, and infant mortality rates were very high because we didn't have very good uh, like medication, um, obviously very little to no technology, um, or no technology as we know it these days, um, very low sanitation, um, no connections or uh, ability to talk across population groups, um, that sort of thing. But in the last 1,000 years, the population growth has increased exponentially. So exponential means increasing more and more rapidly. The current human population is estimated to be just over 7.3 billion people. It increased by approximately 200,000 people per day. So every year, 83 million people. Virtually all the growth is in developing countries with the growth of the youth population occurring in the poorest of these countries. China has the largest population of any country, around 1.4 billion people, and India has the second largest population, 1.28 billion people. So what has caused this exponential growth? The recent alarming population growth is mainly due to the fact that humans have reduced environmental resistance. I remember that in one of the previous videos, I think it was the first one, on population studies, we spoke about environmental resistance as the factors that regulate the population and keep it from increasing too far over the carrying capacity. And humans have increased the actual carrying capacity of the world's food producing regions. So through agriculture, we've been able to produce a lot more food and a lot more resources in a very small area, which allows the carrying capacity to increase because we now have more resources. So the two ways that we've done this is obviously with increased food production due to more land being cultivated and improving the methods of food production in ways such as using artificial fertilizers, um, even things like asexual reproduction and that sort of thing to increase the yield of monoculture crops. Monoculture would be just focusing and going on one type of crop. Um, the other way that humans have allowed um, this exponential population growth and reducing environmental resistance and increasing the carrying capacity is that we greatly improve the methods of treating disease so medication sanitation etc which has obviously allowed more people to stay alive and therefore more reduction more reproduction to occur uh, countries of the world definitely differ um, there's two main groups that we can divide countries into the more developed countries and less developed countries, so MDCs and LDCs. If you do geography, you'll have heard of MEDCs and LEDCs, which are more economically developed and less economically developed countries. This is a really similar concept. It just we're not just talking about um, the economics of a country now. We just we're talking about in general their population um, growth and that sort of thing, um, whether they're MDCs or LDCs. So the more developed countries have a lot slower population growth, usually at around 0.1% per year, um, and a very high standard of living, or a definite higher standard of living than in the LDCs. These would be things like North America, Europe, Japan, and Australia. The LDCs have a much, rapid, much more rapid population growth, around 1.6% per year, and obviously a lot lower standard of living. Things like Latin America, Africa, and Asia. And obviously there's countries that don't fit. It's not the whole of Africa, the whole of Asia, but in general, these are the regions that are LDCs and these are the regions that are MDCs. So it's thought in the next um, 150 years or so, human population growth will start to be less exponential and become a more logistic type of growth form. If you've done log graphs, you'll know that in general, a log graph looks like this, but um, this would be a logistic um, sort of growth where we eventually we start growing exponentially. And then as we near carrying capacity, the growth starts to slow down. This is what we want. Um, it's also called an X-shaped graph because you can see it looks like an X-shape. And we see that it levels off near carrying capacity. That's the ideal um, situation. What's happening right now or what has been happening in the past few years is exponential growth, where it's just 
rapidly increasing and increasing at an even more rapid rate. And we can call this an H, I mean, sorry, a J-shaped graph. So the MDCs in the industrialized countries have shifted to a more stable population like this because population growth has become, be, begun to decline. Uh, birth rates um, have decreased due to late marriages, uh, more birth control and sexual abstinence in places like Japan, Germany and Britain. But the LDCs populations continue to grow as medical treatments um, begin to improve and enable more women in their reproductive years to live longer and therefore to produce more babies. In the LDCs, there's um, often a lack of education, not education in the way we see it in maths and English and stuff, but more of what is contraception? Why should we not produce 10 children in our lifetime? Why, should, why is it better to maybe produce two? Something like that. And obviously a lack of finances to get access to things like birth control and stuff. And um, they'll often, um, if, they, if it's a very, it's a developing country that relies um, more on agriculture and farming and that sort of thing, people often have a lot of children so that the children can help them on the farm. Um, if, they have, if you only have one child, you only have one farm worker, that's one free farm worker that will grow up and take the name of the farm and take over from you and stuff. So you preferably want more children, which is obviously also led to um, more rapid uh, population growth. And if you do do geography, some of these concepts link quite well to the um, e economics and stuff in geography. So what, are we, what is the ecological footprint of MDCs and LDCs? We know that the population growth of humans is placing extreme pressure on the Earth's resources and on the environment. Even though LDCs actually do have higher growth rates, which is what we spoke about, and often have larger populations, the pressure placed in the environment is actually primarily due to the MDCs, the more developed countries. The MDCs are responsible for more total pollution and more consumption than LDCs. The MDCs account for 22% of the world's population. That's not that much, around one-fifth. Yet they produce 90% of the hazardous waste and use more resources. So they, they account for one-fifth of the world's population, but they produce nine-tenths of the hazardous waste. You can see that the MDCs now have a great ecological footprint. Um, um, this image was... a a cartoon in a previous exam in a past paper and the question was how does the image below reflect an understanding of the ecological footprint of developed and developing countries um, so the ecological footprint is just um, I think we're going to explore it in a later video in a later slide but what it's saying is just how much of an impact um, do, does a country have on the world's environment um, that will be the main idea of the ecological footprint, how much waste they produce, how much they consume, how much um, pollution they release, that sort of thing. And you can see here that um, if you were to answer this question in an exam, it's obviously for six marks, but it's just a very uh, basic idea of what you do is you can see that this man, the smaller man represents the less developed countries and the larger man represents the more developed countries. We can see the small man has tiny footprints whereas the larger man has these massive footprints. What, it's, what this cartoon is trying to say is that um, developing countries, so less developed countries, um, have a much smaller ecological footprint. They um, produce less waste, less carbon um, pollution. Uh, they consume less goods, less greenhouse gases, that sort of thing. Um, they have a much smaller uh, impact on the environment overall. Whereas um, developed countries, so MDCs, have a much larger overall impact. So then we're going to look at population pyramids. This is quite important. They'll often ask you questions um, to see your understanding of these population pyramids. Um, also called an age sex pyramid, a population pyramid is a bar graph that shows the composition by age and sex of a nation's population at a time of census, so just when they're measuring it. It's a convenient way to show in visual form how a, natural how a national population is made up. So you can see on the right is females and on the left is males. Females are always on the right because haha, <laughs> women are always right. Um, in the bottom, in the x-axis, they'll often do percent of the population, but they may also do numbers in millions or hundreds of thousands or whatever. Um, and on the y-axis, we have the age. So we can see how the population is broken up into age and gender. Um, 
And if we wanted to say, okay, how many, let's say this country, South Africa, how many females are there over the age of 60? Well, we can go from 60 to 64 and all these ages above are over the age of 60. So now we want to know the females. We can look here. This would be around about 1%, 1%. We can add it up, obviously. You'd measure it a lot better in the exam, but let's say this is 2% and that's another whole percent. So let's say this altogether would be um, 3%. We say, okay, we know that females over the age of 60 make up 3% of South Africa's population. That's how you'd uh, read it off. Um, the population pyramid contains three major age or sex groups. Um, we have the pre-reproductive stage, the reproductive stage, and post-reproductive. Pre-reproductive is usually from about um, age 0 to 14. Reproductive is from uh, usually about 15 to age 64. That's what they might specify in the exam, but usually um, if they don't, these are the ages you work with. And post-reproductive is 64 and older. The age structure of the population is determined by what proportion of the population falls into each of these age groups. So we can see here this country has a very large pre-reproductive population, a medium-sized uh, reproductive population or working group, and a very small post-reproductive population. When we talk about the age structure of a population, this is the relative numbers of individuals of each age in a population. So how um, the composition of the country of the population um, can be divided into people of different ages. So a population graph, as I said, is typically constructed where there's two back-to-back -back bar graphs, male and female, with population um, numbers plotted on the horizontal axis and age on the vertical axis. Top of the pyramid is older population, bottom of the pyramid is younger population, males on left, females on right, in five-year age groups, not to four is five years, not one, two, three, four, is five years. Um, this may be shown as percentage of males, or it can be um, uh, in actual numbers. And usually there's, um, in the older age groups, there's actually slightly more females than males. And you can see it here in the 80 plus, we can see that this bar is a little bit thicker than this bar. Um, what are the different pyramid shapes depict? So there's usually, um, three main types of population graphs, so three main um, shapes of population pyramids. The first one is a rapidly growing population. It has a very high birth rate. There's a rapid fall in each upward, upward age group due to the high death rate, and there's quite a short life expectancy. Rapidly growing populations are usually found in LDCs, like um, a lot of countries in Africa, Asia, and South, South America. So we can see that there's a very high birth rate here. The numbers of um, young people are very high. And, but we can also see that the death rate is really high. There's very few people here and it falls quite quickly. It's quite a, like a steep slope. Um, um, we can see that this does make sense when we, when we think about LDCs because they would have quite a high birth rate as we spoke about a bit earlier. And they also have quite a high death rate because they don't have as much access to medication um, and healthcare and that sort of thing. The second type of population is a um, very a stable population where there's a declining birth rate. So it doesn't have to be a very low birth rate or it doesn't have to be um, like a negative birth rate. It just has to be that it's starting to get lower. The population isn't increasing really rapidly. There's a very low death rate. So in the older population, it's usually quite high and there's usually very little change between the ages. As we can see here, there's quite a big gap um, showing that there's quite a high birth um, a death rate um, and there's, the population is increasing rapidly. But if we look here, there's almost a negative gap or no gap between ages showing the lower birth rate um, and the lower death rate. And there's more people living to old age. So we can see here that there's very few people um, at an old age, but here there'd be more people. These would be MDCs like Canada and Australia, uh, Switzerland, Germany, that sort of thing. Um, but remember, this is stable and not, um, so we had rapidly growing. We have a stable population here and we're gonna get to um, an actual declining population. So if we look at the stable population, we can see that it's quite stable. Um, it's not changing rapidly between the ages. This is probably a better example of a stable population because it's more accurate that there is actually less people, even though you can see here it's 
um, a little bit like concave, like the um, increasing population. This is only because at old age, obviously, there's going to be less people. Many people will die of old age. Um, and again, you can see here how the female population in the older age groups is slightly larger. Um, this, would, this is an example of Australia, and you can see that there's quite a low birth rate. Um, it's almost going inwards a little bit, um, but there's also a very low death rate. It's quite stable, and the population is, isn't going to grow massively over time, but it's not going to decrease massively either. I mean, the third type of pyramid is a declining population. There's a very low birth rate. There's also a low death rate, and there's a higher dependency ratio. The dependency ratio is the ratio of older people and younger babies to the working class. So the ratio of um, pre and post reproductive people to the reproductive class. Um, so to work out the dependency ratio, they usually wouldn't ask you to work out the actual ratio, but they could ask you to compare. And um, you'd add up all the people in the reproductive stage. So every, I mean, post reproductive, so everyone over 64 and everyone under the age of 15 add them up, let's say you get uh, 1 million people. And then you would add up everyone in the reproductive stage and let's say you get 1.5 million people. Now the ratio is 1 to 1.5. If you did it on another pyramid, you might get a ratio of um, 1 to 4, which means that for every one person, there's four, to four um, people who can provide food, which means there's a, lot, a lower dependency ratio than in a declining population. Um, it has quite a high dependency ratio. So there's quite a lot of old people and young babies that are depending on the reproductive class. Um, in a declining population, people often have a longer life expectancy and it's found in the more affluent countries like Sweden and Norway. What is the purpose of population graphs? Well, we can tell a lot of information from a population graph. They can provide a quick way to assess how rapidly or slowly a nation's population is growing which is what we spoke about with declining, increasing, and stable populations. They can show for countries more developed or less developed because usually, not always, but a large majority of the time, if a country is stable or declining population, it's more developed, and if it's rapidly increasing, it would be a less developed country. They can show how many people of each age range live in a country. They can show a history of a nation's growth. So we can see um, how the nation grew more probably more rapidly here, and then how it's starting to slow down. There was a slight peak over there, and we can see that um, how the nation grew over time. It's also useful in determining the economic dependence being supported. So, so that's the dependency ratio that I spoke about earlier. Um, what is, um, as I said earlier, we um, call the naught 15 year olds the pre-reproductive stage. These are children who form an economically dependent group. Above the age of 65 are, again, senior citizens who are also dependent on the country's workforce. And between 15 and 65, these are the productive working group that forms the labor force of a country and they, they form the reproductive class, the people that can reproduce. Um, what factors can cause the makeup of, of a population to change? So some of the main changes can be due to HIV or AIDS. This is obviously particularly relevant in South Africa which causes the death of many sexually active young men and women, particular, particularly in developing countries. Um, high proportions of young immigrants being rapidly absorbed or losses due to the immigration of able-bodied young adults. So either getting a lot of young immigrants who are um, coming into a country, causing the uh, working class to increase or losing a lot of able-bodied young adults. Um, losses due to able-bodied men fighting wars and reduce birth rates in times of economic crisis. For South Africa's population growth, um, in 2014, Stats SA estimates the mid-year population is 54 million. I think today we're around uh, 59 million. In 1960, it was 17.4 million. So since between 1960 and 2014, an increase of over 190%. That's a lot. Um, it shows how rapidly we're increasing but we can see that we are actually slowing down the rate of the increase. Even though the population is increase, increasing still, it's increasing more slowly. So in 1993, it was a 2.4% increase, but in 2009, it was only 0.28%. This is, um, a lot of it is due to HIV or AIDS deaths. Um, this is just a note you can read about HIV. 
will the environment survive this human explosion? So we know how quickly we're growing. Will the environment be able to cope? As I said earlier, an ecological footprint is a measure of a human demand on the Earth's ecosystems. So it represents the amount of biologically productive land and sea area necessary to supply the resources a human population consumes and to assimilate the waste generated. So in other words, the, the ecological footprints accounts for all the demands in the biosphere, including carbon emissions from fossil fuels, the demand on food sources, the quantity of living resources required to make the goods we consume, and the amount of land we take out of production when we pave it over to build cities and um, urban areas. So basically what the ecological footprint represents is how much productive land, so how much land that we could use, or do we need to support the entire human population, not only to produce food um, and to produce everything that we consume, all the resources, but also to collect the waste that we generate. And we can see that in most cases, we need more land than we actually have. So our ecological footprint is larger, a lot larger than it should be. Um, at present, the total world ecological footprint is 2.7 global, global hectares per person. So um, what it's basically saying is each human requires around about 2.7 hectares for the, all the resources they produce and the waste they generate. As the world average biocapacity is 2.1 global hectares per person, um, there is an ecological deficit of 0.6 global hectares. Obviously, this changes from year to year. So when I talk about biocapacity, I mean the amount of productive land and water available to produce the resources we use and absorb the waste we produce. So we know the ecological footprint is how much land um, we need to produce the resources and assimilate the waste. The biocapacity is how much land we actually have. And as we see here, we need more land than we have. That means we're in an ecological deficit. A country that has an ecological deficit is called an ecological debtor country. And a country without an ecological deficit is called an ecological creditor country. So we can talk about our ecological footprint on a global scale, which is what we spoke about here. But we can also look at it country to country and how um, each country, how much land each country needs and how much land each country has overall. And we can see that a lot of countries are ecological debtors. They need more land than um, they actually have. So they're using more than they should. Um, what can we learn from ecological footprints? Ecological footprint is now widely used around the globe as an indicator of environmental sustainability. So um, can we carry on like this? Can the earth keep going like it is? Most MDC countries are running ecological deficits. So the ecological footprints are larger than their biological capacity. Um, this deficit is compensated for by using resources from other countries. So because these countries don't have enough land and resources to support the entire population, they take resources from other countries. MDCs, as I said, had the um, largest ecological um, footprint. The economy of countries such as the United States requires much more land and energy and water and produces much more waste than a lot of LDCs even though LDCs have more of the world's population. LDC countries may use very little of the world's resources overall, but their urban population is increasing rapidly. Not only is the entire population increasing rapidly, but a lot of their population is moving to urban areas or building new urban areas, which means that their standard of living is usually increasing, causing them to use more and more resources. So if ecological footprints continue to increase, so if we continue to place more and more pressure, on the environment and need more and more land and resources to survive, then the natural resources we need to maintain human life will be greatly reduced. And unless we try and solve this problem, our planet Earth will be permanently damaged. So 85% of the world population right now is living in a country that's running on a biocapacity deficit. So we 80% of the world's population is living in ecological data countries. Um, we can look at the human need for land versus the, um, the need to conserve land. South Africa, like many other countries, is dependent on the diversity and richness of its natural resources to sustain its population and to contribute to its economic growth. But as the human population increases and expectations of living standards rise, these natural resources are put under pressure 
as more and more natural habitats are converted to agriculture, forestry, mining activities, and human settlements. So these natural habitats are used now for farming, for forestry, for mining, and to build human settlements. So obviously farming produces food and, and forestry and mining activities, etc., produce resources we need and bring in income. So they are, without a doubt, important. But are they important enough to, um, to equate and to make up for the fact that we are losing these natural habitats? That's the big debate. Towns and cities generate and accumulate wealth and are centers of education, economic opportunity, employment and culture. But they take over areas of productive agri agricultural land, so land used to produce food. And these towns and cities use large quantities of water, energy, food and raw materials. And they generate enormous quantities of waste and pollution. So what we're saying is, is this education, economic acti activity, so on, is it good enough to um, make up for the fact that we're losing all this productive agricultural land, that we're using way too much water, energy, food, and we're producing way too much waste and pollution? Is it equal? Does it make up for it or not? Um, agriculture, forestry, and mining are also important for national growth and development, as I said, but they alter the natural environment and cause tremendous environmental degradation. Rapid population growth can result in the exploitation of natural resources, so using it and using it, using it without giving something back and making it sustainable. Developing countries are often faced with the dilemma of food now versus natural resources later. So should we right now concentrate on using this land, getting our food, keeping our people alive? But if we do that, we're not gonna be able to produce food and stuff in the future because all our natural resources will be uh, used up. That's the big dilemma. In all forms of land use, therefore, there has to be a, a compromise reached between economic development and environmental degradation. It's therefore important to conserve as much of the remaining natural environment as we can. South Africa set the target of increasing land under formal conservation from 5 to 4% in 1994 to 8% in 2010, and its marine protected areas from 11% to 20%. Conservation is protecting something and keeping it in a healthy state. Things like the Kalihari Gemsburg National Park join up with the bordering Gemsburg National Park in Botswana to form the Kalahari Transfrontier Park, one of the largest conservation areas in the world. That's great news. We need that. The Addo Elephant Park has recently been expanded to form a mega park, the Greater Addo Elephant National Park, which is probably the only park in the world where you can see the big seven. So the big five, elephant, rhino, lion, buffalo, and leopard, and the other two, whale and great white shark. So not only is this really good for um, conserving land, it's, meeting, it's trying to meet our goal, but it's also um, obviously really helps with tourism, which then helps with um, developing the economy and helping the economy. So we can see that that's actually got probably more benefits than the disadvantages, which are losing uh, space for agricultural production, for land settlements, that sort of thing. So whose responsibility is it to make sure that we're not using up too much of the land, to make sure that we're not running too much of an ecological deficit? Under Schedule 4 of the Constitution, provinces and the national government, um, oh, sorry, under Schedule 4 of the Constitution, provinces and the national government share environmental responsibility, and they're all committed to the basic principles of sustainable development, which is the development that needs, meets the needs of the present, so provides resources for the present, while not compromising, compromising the needs of the future generations. So it's balancing um, the um, LDC's issue where they, um, I can't remember which, but you're here, where they spoke about food now versus natural resources later. Sustainable development is trying to balance those needs. Currently, however, this is not really happening. Development planning doesn't always pay sufficient attention to environmental issues. In 2005, environmental management expectors, the Green Scorpions, were um, formed to in, in, enforce environmental laws. Some contentious issues or areas of conflict, um, conflict facing environmentalists are the use of land for um, traditional land for conservation or game reserves. Um, can we use traditional land to conserve and to make game reserves or should it be um, owned by the traditional um, owners of the land? 
There's also tension between hunting and poaching and proclaimed nature or game reserves. Are the benefits of hunting, the tourism it brings, um, the meat it provides, do they outweigh the um, benefits of conserving game reserves? Um, obviously, these aren't issues that you're going to need to have um, a very strong opinion on. This is not your paper two topic, so you're not going to need to write essays or anything. But it's always good to know um, stuff like this and to have maybe a little bit of an inform informed opinion. So they could ask you something like give one advantage and disadvantage of, say, hunting. Um, other areas of conflict are the harvesting of plants and animals for traditional medicines and the implementation of ecotourism as a sustainable way of using a conservation area for leisure and at the same time producing economic benefits for the local people who are living in that conservation area. So that's the main, um, or that's basically everything there is for human population dynamics. These last few slides aren't incredibly important. Um, the, the content certainly isn't like um, this sort of thing and how much South Africa set the target to, that's not really gonna be asked, but it's obviously very important to have an idea of what are some of the dilemmas that we face, the conservation of land versus the need for economic development. Um, those sort of issues are obviously very important and can always be asked, but you don't have to use the specific knowledge. Most, a lot of people will have some sort of general knowledge on these topics. The more important stuff from this slide was the population pyramids, um, the LCDs and, I mean, sorry, LDCs and MDCs, um, the terms ecological deficit, ecological footprint, that sort of thing. Those would be the more important concepts. 